Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, said, if you are depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you're at peace, you're living in the present. Hopefully today's speaker will help us capture more of that peace and live more in the present. Dr. Moore Gorman is an international speaker, author, and America's leading stress elimination expert. He was born and raised in Baltimore, graduated from Duke University and the University of Maryland Medical School. He practiced internal medicine in Baltimore for 23 years, and then spent 15 years as health and wellness medical director for Capital Blue Cross in Harrisburg. Dr. Orman specializes in teaching people how to eliminate stress rather than just manage the symptoms of it. He has published more than 10 books, and I learned today he ran in five marathons. He has also conducted stress reduction seminars for business owners, medical professionals, the clergy, and even the FBI. Uh, Dr. Orman currently runs his own Stress Mastery Academy and his unique Facebook group called the League of Extraordinary Stress Eliminators. He has also been the official sponsor of the National Stress Awareness Month held every April. Dr. Orman's insights and teaching about how to eliminate stress are radically different from what most other experts believe and recommend. Whenever I'm stressed, my go-to is dark chocolate. Um, you may find it curious that stress spelled backwards is desserts. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. Um, now, I don't know if this will be... Dr. Orman's unique stress elimination approach enables people like me, and maybe some of you, to re achieve results faster, more permanently, and with less struggle and effort than can be achieved with more traditional stress management approaches <coughs> and well-known relaxation techniques. Please give a warm rotary welcome to Dr. Ward Warren. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Uh, as Ann mentioned, I'm Dr. Mort Orman, and I am very happy to be here with you today. I mean, I am very, very happy to be here with you today, and I'll tell you uh, what I mean by that in just a moment. But our topic today is how to eliminate post-holiday stress, post-election stress, and basically any other type of stress you might experience, whether it's the common everyday ordinary stress that many of us experience uh, frequently, or some new unexpected crisis or challenge that just hits when we're not counting on it. Uh, any kind of stress that you might experience in your life, um, I want to talk a little bit today about how we can deal with that and perhaps deal with it better than maybe we have been doing up until now. So we have a new year. We just came through an interesting <coughs> two-month period, um, November and December, typically a time of stress for many folks during the holidays. And then every four years, we have the additional uh, issue of a presidential election, which can be stressful in addition. And of course, this year uh, we had a very uh, contentious election. A lot of people were stressed. Some people <coughs> were be very stressed, uh, at, even today. Uh, so we had that all that going on. And then probably for some of us in this room, uh, there may have been other unexpected crises or challenges that happened, just happened to occur during the holiday season that just added additional you know, pressures and, and challenges during that particular time of year. Um, I know that was true for me this year uh, that normally I don't uh, typically have to deal with, but I had something come up this year that was indeed one of the biggest crises of my life. So um, I don't know if you remember exactly where you were on Monday, November the 7th, the day before the election, but I distinctly recall where I was. At about 2 o'clock on that day, I was on um, the operating table at the University of Maryland Hospital in Baltimore having life-saving open-heart surgery. And i got to tell you, that was not on my wish list. That was not on my holiday list. I was not interested in doing that at all. Um, could have been worse, at least my hair didn't turn blue. <laughs> but, but 
but it was a stress nonetheless. <laughs> and uh, it caught me kind of by surprise. I had been in perfectly good health, or very good health, and uh, started developing some chest pains uh, last summer. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it was uh, posed to me that I needed to have that surgery. Um, I had a catheterization <coughs> in late August and uh, for some chest pain that I was having, and the doctors came into the room after the procedure, after they had looked at the films, and said, um, you, have a, you have a critical lesion and uh, can't be fixed with stents. Uh, we want to keep you overnight and do the surgery the next morning. I said, uh, I'm, not, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not too keen on that whole idea. I really need some time to digest this, think about it, try to decide you know, what my best options are. So I, I went through a two-month period before November uh, of, of wrestling with this whole issue of what was I going to do, did I really need to have that massive procedure done, uh, could I have gotten away with a lesser procedure or some combination of stents or some of the newer technologies that were you know, available today. So I, I went through a process of evaluating um, what my options were and eventually when I discovered that uh, really, there were no better options than, than the open heart procedure. Uh, okay, so where was I going to have it done? Who was going to do it? When was it going to be done? And what kind of procedure was I going to have? Because there's multiple ways I can actually do that procedure. So I had to go through all these things and meet with doctors and meet with people. And, and it was over a two-month period. And you, you have to know that I knew, as a physician, I knew I was taking a risk in doing that. I knew that any day, you know, I could have a sudden heart attack and die. Um, I knew that every night when I laid my head down on my pillow, uh, I might not wake up the next morning. Um, so when I say that I'm happy to be here with you, <laughs> I really mean I'm happy to be alive so I can be here with you and, and share some of the things that I've been sharing with people about stress for the last 30 years. Um, but that was a very difficult period for me. Uh, it could have been extremely, extremely stressful. Uh, I basically had several months to think about it, worry about it, and drive myself crazy if, uh, if I wanted to have done that. And um, one of the things I discovered in this whole process is it's a very different experience when you're on one end of the stethoscope telling somebody they should have open heart surgery. <laughs> Which I did, you know, I advised many of my own patients to have that procedure, many of them did and, and uh, did quite well. Of course, there were some that didn't, so. I knew about some of the adverse outcomes and consequences and, and catastrophes that can happen. But it's very different when you have somebody telling you, you know, you need to have that procedure done. So uh, it kind of shocked me and threw me for a loop, unexpected, uh, and I had to deal with it. Oops. <clears throat> However, what I'm here to tell you is that I had very little stress, anxiety, or sleepless nights uh, through this entire two-month procedure. I had actually very little, very little stress uh, during the actual procedure itself in the four or five days I stayed in the hospital. Uh, here I am, this is, uh, this is the next day after the surgery, this is Tuesday, uh, election day, when they had me up in a chair and eventually later on the day had me walking in the room, I'm sorry, in the halls. Um, so I actually enjoyed myself, if you can believe that, uh, during, during this day in the hospital. Um, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. And the recovery process during the last two months has also been relatively stress-free. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is how in the heck did I do that? <coughs> how did I go through that potentially very stressful period of time, which ordinarily might have stressed a lot of people, um, including physicians, uh, probably more so for physicians, because we know all the horrible things that can happen. Um, how did I go through that <coughs> process? The, the, discovery process, the decision process, the surgery, the recovery, without being, you know, extraordinarily stressed by it. And the answer is that I have a system. And I was very happy that I had this system in place. It's a system that I built almost 30 years ago, uh, back when I was extremely stressed as a typical physician. I had a lot of stress in medical school, medical training, in my first three years of practice. And like most physicians, we just put up with it. And, and suffer through it uh, silently, trying to pretend that we've got everything together, you know, we're kind of cool, <laughs> professional, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I finally discovered uh, how to beat that problem after trying all the traditional stress management stuff that didn't work. So I built this system over a number of years. I've been teaching this over the last 30 plus years. And I was very happy 
to have this system in place when this sudden crisis hit me because I relied on this very heavily to get through that several month period. And I actually use the same system I've been using it almost every day of my life uh, for 30 years to deal with everyday ordinary stresses that come up. So part of what I want to do today is just give you a little insight into what the system is and, and how it can be very helpful. <coughs> so three questions I want to <coughs> pose to you today. First one is, do you all have a system for dealing, for understanding and dealing with stress? And, and I'll cut the suspense because the answer is yes, you do. Everybody in this room has a system, whether you know it or not. You have a system for understanding and dealing with stress. We all do. I did back when I was a stressed out physician, um, and I do now. I just have a different one than I had back then. But basically, you grow up in our society, we're given a, a system, or we discover it on our own through our own research and, and, and education. But everybody ends up with some kind of a system. Now, we, most of us don't even know that we have a system. We don't know what it consists of, but it's there. And it, when we feel stressed or we run into problems or we get upset um, or unexpected crises or challenges hit, then we reference the system to know what to do or to how to respond or how to deal with it or make it go away. So we all have a system. Next question is, do you have a good system? So just because you have a system doesn't mean it's necessarily a good system. There are good ones and there are not so good ones. So, for example, if your system for dealing with stress is Whenever you get upset, you consume copious amounts of alcohol. You know, that's a system. It may not be a great system, but it's a, it's a system. Same thing as if, uh, you mentioned chocolate, same thing is, you know, if your system for dealing with stress is, you know, you down a pint, pint of haagen ice cream every time you get upset, uh, or, or have a relationship crisis or argument or something like that, then that's a system, but it may not be the best system you can have. So the real important question is, do you have a great system for dealing with stress? Do you have a fantastic system? Do you have a top of the line system? And, and that's the kind of system that I was happy I had, you know, and that I still have today, uh, and, and is available to me when anything comes up in my life that could be potentially stressful. So I'm going to give you a little insight into what that system is. Now, so what is a system? I'm talking about a system. We all know what systems are, basically, but uh, they're uh, an assembly of components that, that work together. Uh, to produce a certain outcome, usually a desirable outcome. So, for example, uh, anybody in business, you know that part of the success of your business is you have a lot of business systems that, that are, help you be successful. So, you know, you have accounting systems, you may have uh, client acquisition systems, you may have procurement systems, uh, you, you may have all kinds of systems for assessing your competition in your marketplace. We all know that there are various business systems that you have to have, to, you don't have to have, but it helps to have. Uh, to run a successful business. Same thing if you just run a household. I mean, there's all kinds of systems that we use to run our households and to make things easier and to produce certain results. So we're all very familiar with systems. Uh, our bodies are systems. You know, there's circulatory system, respiratory system, nervous system, you know, that are all combined to, to allow us to, our bodies to function. So systems are all around us. We can't escape them. <coughs> and, and we even have mechanical systems. So our computers are, you know, a system. Our automobiles are systems. Um, and again, now the automobile um, has evolved and changed over the last several decades, but the actual com the system structure, you know, at a sort of a skeleton level, the basic raw components so haven't really changed that much. You know, you still have an engine, you still have wheels, may not be four, but you still have wheels, you still have a seating compartment, a drive shaft, uh, an electrical system, an exhaust, an exhaust mechanism. So the components have stayed pretty much the same, and the relationship of the components have been pretty much the same. But they, all the components have evolved and changed over time. But the basic structure of the system has stayed the same. What's important to realize is we also have cognitive systems. Many, many, many cognitive systems. Some of which we're aware of, some of which we're not. Some of which we built intentionally, some of which were given to us by our society or by other people or experts or things we see in the movies or read, on, read in magazines or, or get taught to us in seminars, workshops, who knows where. But we all get these cognitive systems as we go through life and they function to help direct us and guide us uh, when we, we need to get things done or we need to handle a problem or, or solve some issue or, or be successful at something. So I had a cognitive system <coughs> once upon a time many years ago, 
It, it was a system for how to succeed in relationships. And especially it was a system for how to succeed in relationships with women. And the interesting thing about the system was, I didn't even know that I had it for many years. But it was there in the background. I subsequently <coughs> discovered it had, been, it had been there in the background, guiding me, directing me, and how to behave in relationships with women. And uh, the other interesting thing about the system is that I had a series of relationships with women when I was younger, and every single one of them failed. None of them succeeded. And uh, some of them would fail very quickly in a matter of weeks. Some would take a month or two to fail. Some even went a, a year or more. But they all ended up failing. And, and every time that I had a failure in one of my relationships, I would take stock of what happened, try to assess the story, you know, what went wrong so that I didn't commit that same mistake again and, and, and you know, could have a successful relationship the next time. And of course, that never worked because I was always misdiagnosing the problem, again, you see, I didn't know that I had this system that was in the background that was telling me how to behave in relationships. I didn't even know it was there. But after a while, I had to admit, I, I just couldn't deny the truth anymore, that every time one of these relationships failed, I, I was always there. <laughs> and I tried to deny that for as long as I could. It was always something wrong with the woman, you see. <laughs> But uh, I, I never was able to correct by looking at it that way. Um, it was only when I started to realize that there must be something going on in me that I'm unaware of that, that's causing all this difficulty. So I started trying to figure out, okay, how do you, what do people know? Who are the people who know how relationships work? Let me get around some of them. Let me soak up some of their <coughs> wisdom and, and find out what's going on. And I eventually discovered that I had this cognitive system. And I'd had it for years, and I didn't know what it was, but it was, it was mucking up the works. Um, and it, it was producing consistently, you know, this kind of outcome. And, and, and what I eventually discovered, once I, once I was able to see that system and I saw what the components were, and, and I knew what the thought processes were that were driving me, I could easily discover that it was, it was actually a horrible system. I mean, nobody would want to be in relationship with me, you know, if I behaved that way. And, and I hadn't really, I hadn't seen that before. It, it, instead of being a success system, it was a failure system, and it worked every single time. <laughs> so I immediately realized if I was going to have success in, relation, in a relationship with a woman, I got to change my system. I got to come up with a new system that, that's built on principles and strategies and, and, and concepts that, that actually work to have success in relationship. And I'm happy to say I was able to do that. It didn't happen overnight, but I was able to learn some things and, and, and associate with some people who knew some things about relationships. And, and I've been happily married now for the last 32 years. So I just want to I, I want to share that with you because it, it it highlights the power of systems, both to cause us to not be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish, and if you improve your system, you can accomplish things you might want to cut, things you might have thought were impossible. I never thought it was impossible. I never thought it was really possible for me to be successful in marriage. And, and, and it wouldn't have been in my old system. Um, uh, so a lot of people think that it's not possible to eliminate stress <coughs> in life. And, and I want you to know it is possible. There are many people who've done it. And the way they do it is by realizing that they have a system that doesn't allow them to get there. And, and realizing there are other systems available that could give them that capability. Matter of fact, they already have the capability. We all have that capability. Um, I had it back when I was younger and was very stressed. Couldn't figure out how to get rid of my stress. It was, it was there, I just didn't have the right framework, the right strategy, the right blueprint, the right system for doing, for doing that. So as I said, everybody in this room has a system. We've mostly been given a system. Well, what is the common system that most people have today that you reference, consciously or unconsciously, whenever you feel stressed or have a stressful problem that you need to deal with. Well, it's a system that has many components to it. It's actually quite complex, but there's some sort of major, major components. And it starts off in the middle with a basic overriding uh, method for approaching stress. And mostly we've been taught to believe that the best way to deal with stress is to manage it. So we, we, and we've been told why that's important, we've been told why it's beneficial, We've been beaten over the head about what happens if you don't manage your stress and how it can be damaging to you. And basically, we've been told many ways to manage our stress. And what's important to recognize is that stress management is not just 
a series of strategies <coughs> and techniques like yoga, meditation, relaxation, listening to soft music. Yes, it has those things, but what comes with it is a whole philosophy, a whole understanding of what stress is as a human experience and why stress management is the best way to approach it. And all that stuff is part of the system. All those beliefs and concepts are part of the system that has us conclude and buy into the idea that the best way to deal with our stress is to manage it. Manage it. So for example, part of the system that we all have are certain understandings about what it means to be human. We're talking about stress as a human phenomenon. We know we're human beings and when we feel stress, whether we do it consciously, mostly unconsciously, we're referencing our blueprint that's in our system about what it means to be human. And you know, if that blueprint is faulty, that could cause problems. But in fact, a lot of us are walking around with a faulty blueprint about what it means to be human, and we don't know it. Uh, some of us don't even know that that's, that's a component of our system. <clears throat> Another big component of this system is ideas we have about stress. What it is, where it comes from, Again, leading to what's the best way to deal with it, namely, manage it. So that's part of our system. Understandings about stress, many of which, i got to tell you, are absolutely false. They're myths. They're misconceptions that have been propagated for many, many, many years. And I've been talking about them for 30 years. It doesn't matter. They're, <laughs> there's so many people who believe them, and it's so strong in our culture that I could talk about it for another 30 years, and they'll still be there. All right? that, that's how dominant they are. That's how pervasive they are. But they're there and we don't even know that they're myths. And then we also, a big component of our system is understanding what's causing our stress to occur. Just like I wanted to understand what was causing my relationship failures to occur. And mostly we've been taught to focus on external causes. So if you pick up any book about stress, you pick up the magazine article about stress, or whatever, they're gonna focus on the external situations and events, you know, your boss, your coworkers, uh, the conditions you know, that are going on in society today. Uh, external pressures and demand. All, all kinds of stuff that are external to us as the main causes of our stress. That's just how we're taught to think. That's part of our system now. When, when you're stressed and you want to know why you're stressed, you go to the system, whether you consciously or unconsciously, and you start looking around for things that might be causing your stress. And sure enough, you'll find them. Just like I found a lot of things that were wrong with each woman that got involved. <laughs> Wasn't the whole story, though. <laughs> And then, of course, you're going to have tools. You're going to have strategies and tools uh, and techniques that you're going to use that are all going to be consistent. So everything in these systems makes sense with everything else. So it fits with everything else. It's, it's a, that's why I say it's a set of philosophies, a set of beliefs, a set of assumptions, that, that many of which we're not aware of, but they're all hooked together uh, to, to get us to, to know what to do when, when we're stressed. So I would submit to you that's the, that's the system most of us have. Again, that's a system I used to have. You know, that was how I was trained in my medical training. Um, if you pick up self-help books on dealing with stress, you're going to find you get trained in that system. You go to seminars and workshops, most of the ones that are being done today or our <coughs> companies are going to implant the system in people's brains. The problem is, as I said, that system has a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes, a lot of false ideas, but we don't get this warning system. <laughs> But we don't get to know, or, you know, or get the feedback like we do with our computers. When our computer hits a glitch or something goes faulty in our computers, we get this blue screen that goes, screams at us and says, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> you gotta, gotta fix it. You gotta pay attention. We don't get that. We get to go through life with our same, you know, system that has a lot of myths and misconceptions and false ideas in it and doesn't really let us get to where we want to go and have, get rid of the stress the way we'd like to get rid of it. And, and we don't realize that there's system errors at the bottom of it. So this is my system. It has the same basic you know, structure of components, but everything in yellow is different about my system. So starting with, in the center, my system's not about managing stress. I'm not interested in managing my stress. I want to get rid of it. I don't want to have it in my life. So if part of my problem is I'm you know, I'm getting angry all the time. I don't want to manage my anger. I don't want to punch a punching bag or run around the block or run marathons or do any of those kind of things. I want to stop being an angry person. I don't want to generate the anger in the first place. That's what I would rather do. That's what I call eliminating stress. If I'm having relationship conflicts one after another or failures one right after another, I want to stop that. I don't want to manage it. 
I don't need just a little bit better. I, I want to just stop having that happen. I want to have success. I want to have the relationship that I want to have. I want to have a family. I want to have whatever it is. <clears throat> I, I don't want to manage that. So we're talking about a goal that's different. We're talking about a methodology that's different. You know, my system is built on a methodology that allows me and the people that I teach this to to eliminate stress, not just manage it. And the way I do that is I have very different concepts and understandings about what it means to be human. Very, very different than most of us have been given today. And I have extremely different views about what stress is and where it comes from than most people have in their system today. And I don't tend to focus on the external causes, even though they're there and they do contribute. And if I can make some problem go away by changing my external circumstances, great, I'll do it. But if I can't, I want to know what the internal causes are inside me that are contributing to, you know, to my stress with that situation. I want to be able to pinpoint them. I want to be able to know exactly what they are. And I've been able to do that over the years, develop that capability, build that into my system. So I have that there. And I'm going to show you, give you an example of that uh, in just a few minutes. And then I've developed certain tools and strategies that are very different. And, and you'll leave today, if you want, with a tool that comes from my system that I hope you'll find very useful. A lot of people have. And I'm going to talk about it you know, in just a second. So I want to give you a, a little glimpse of the system, how it's different, what it does. And, and there's lots lots of other components, there's many other tools, many other insights and understandings that are part of the system I have now that I didn't have 30 years ago, but I'm really happy that I have it now. So the thing I want to talk about today is a very common human emotion called anger. So there's a, everybody gets angry. Uh, during the holiday season, maybe you get angry a little more often than usual because there's more stuff going on and more interactions with people that you don't see the rest of the year and all that kind of stuff. So maybe a little more anger goes on to the holidays. Certainly we've seen a lot of anger around the election, yes. <laughs> a lot of that going on in the world today in general. So it would be helpful if we had a system that allowed us to have a good understanding of anger so we could make it go away whenever we wanted to. It doesn't mean you have to make it go away. If the anger is serving a purpose or you like it and you want to keep it, you can. But if you don't, want it, and it's lingering around too long, and you want to get rid of it, or it's causing other problems in your life, wouldn't it be nice to have a system or a tool that would enable you to do that? So I want to, I want to show you how I understand anger as a human phenomenon. And to do that, I want to just give you a little background. And again, this comes from that part of the system where understanding human beings, how human beings operate. Um, so there's lots of different ways of understanding human emotions. I'm just going to share with you the one that I have found most useful. It's not, certainly not the only way. It's not the right way. It's just a way that I found practically helps me. It gives me certain powers that I didn't used to have. Namely, like being able to get rid of anger when I want to get rid of it. So we're all familiar with computers. Just imagine yourself sitting in front of your computer. You push the letter A on the keyboard, and lo and behold, the letter A appears on your monitor. Nothing, no great shakes about that. We all expect that to happen. You'd be surprised if it didn't. But now if I came along and I asked you what caused that to happen, what, what caused the A to appear on your computer screen, most people today have been trained to say, well, that's obvious. It was pushing the A key. That's what caused it. Now, is that the correct answer? Well, it's not incorrect. I mean, that was part of the process. But is that the whole answer? Is that the only cause? And the truth is, it's not. Something else has to be there for that A to appear on the computer screen. And what it is, is there has to be a program running in, invisibly to us in the back of that computer, in the guts of that computer. There has to be an operating system. There has to be a word processing program. It's written in very specific language. You and I don't care what that is. All we care about is to push the A because the A appear on the screen. But if you are building computers and you're a programmer, you better know what that language is. And it's not random. <laughs> it's very precise. And you got to do it exactly. The program has a very specific language uh, and, and instructions that make those pixels show up in that configuration so you don't get a B or an X or just some random stuff. Okay? So there has to be a, a, a program running in the background 
<coughs> in that computer or you don't get the letter A on the screen. Well, the same, it's an analogy for what happens for us as human beings. Whenever we have a strong emotion, all right, when somebody pushes your anger button, it's not just that they push that button, it's that they triggered a program inside you that has to be there if you're experiencing the emotion of anger. And that program is actually not that difficult to understand. It's basically certain ways of thinking and perceiving or looking at the world <coughs> and certain ways of responding uh, automatically. And these things happen automatically. We, we just, we're not thinking these things, just automatically. Something happens and you get angry. You see something, you get angry. You experience something, you get angry. You think about something, you get angry. It just happens automatically in our bodies. But there's a program there, and most of us don't know what that program is. So I'm going to show you what that program is today, and I have, you don't have to take notes or anything, I have printed it out for you. Um, when you go out at the registration desk, if you're interested, you can take this home with you so you can use it as a tool and, and uh, to help you better understand the sources of your anger, at least in the way that I do in my system. I'm just going to go through the thought process piece of it. I'll leave it to you to look at the behavior side of it. But, um, so what are the internal causes of anger? How do we have to be thinking and perceiving in order to feel the emotion of anger? Well, the first thing is we have to, we have to view whatever's going on as if somebody was doing something bad or wrong. So notice, we usually don't get angry if we think something's great or terrific or wonderful. You know, it's usually something, somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing, uh, something bad or wrong. And, and also, someone is usually being hurt or harmed or negatively impacted. <coughs> And, and we, we really used to have, we need to have both of these things, okay, in order to feel angry. So, for example, when the planes flew into the Trade Center, you know, years ago, we all got angry, right? Most, most Americans had an anger reaction. Why? Because that's what we viewed, that's how we viewed it. The terrorists were doing something bad or wrong, they shouldn't have done. Obviously, people were getting killed, Americans were being killed, you know, our country was being invaded bad things. But what if we were, it, what were we, if we were a young up-and-coming terrorist in the Middle East and we were in terrorist training school and we watched that same event on television that same day, would we be angry? No. We'd be jumping for joy. Well, was that something bad or wrong that happened? No. As far as we're concerned, that's great. That was an accomplishment, an achievement, a big one. Someone was hurt or harmed negatively. They were. We weren't. We were actually, our, our aims were forwarded, if you're thinking from a, from a terrorist point of view. So you all know that different people can look at the same situation. One will get angry and one won't. Well, this is why. Because one has this program triggered in them, and they view the world this way, and they assume these things are true, and another might not. <coughs> okay. And then the third piece of the puzzle is the person who did one and two above, who did the bad thing and hurt or harmed somebody, was 100% responsible or unilaterally to blame. So there's almost always this unilateral blame piece. Uh, that, that somebody else did it and we didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, that automatically you know, happens for us when we, when we get angry. And then there's another one, which is the person who admit, the person who did those things and was unilaterally responsible <laughs> should admit what they did wrong, offer to make amends, and or be punished. Have you ever had somebody that you confronted that you thought did something bad or wrong, and they hurt or harmed or potentially hurt or harmed somebody, and you thought they were 100% responsible, and you confronted them and they didn't own up to it. They wouldn't admit it, they got defensive, maybe they attacked you, uh, but they denied you know, that, that they did whatever they did. Doesn't that make you doubly angry? You know why it makes you doubly angry? Because not admitting it is another bad or wrong thing that they just did. <coughs> We were, we were disappointed and let down by the fact that we expected this person to admit it since we gave them the evidence we confronted them, but they didn't. They refused to. They were 100% responsible for not admitting it. We didn't know anything about that. So it just takes it just cycles again. And, and we get another, another dose of anger on top of the one that we already had. That's how anger works. That's the, that's the program that causes anger in human beings. And there's some behavioral things that go along with it that feed into it. Uh, but this is the primary thing that causes anger to occur. And you know what's very interesting about once you understand this program and once, once you understand this relationship to, to anger, what's really fascinating is that more than 50% of the time that we're feeling angry and we're thinking these thoughts 
and we're thinking these thoughts are true, they're not. Somewhere there's a fly in the ointment. One of these top three, anyway, beliefs, perceptions, assumptions, is not going to be true. It's amazing how often that happens. But you would never know that unless you knew, you know, what was going on, unless you knew the mechanism that was producing your anger in the first place. Because you wouldn't be able to question these things. You wouldn't be able to take stock of them, challenge them, ask yourself the question, did somebody really do something bad or wrong? Was somebody really hurt or wrong? Were that, was that person 100% unilateral responsible? And is it true that I had absolutely nothing to do with it? You'd be amazed at how often that one is it really true. Give me, give me an example. I used to... I used to love to get upset with, when I was in my younger years, uh, before I had this. Uh, I used to love to get angry with people when they cut me off in traffic. Isn't that fun? You know, you're in your car, you're safe. Well, less, less, you used to be safer, but you could, you could get shot now. But, but, you know, you like to work up that anger, you, you know, you start making gestures, and then, you know, you know whatever. Um, I, I used to do that. So I, used, I used to love that. And then one day, as I was getting into this stuff and learning this stuff, one day I'm driving down the road, I'm in the right-hand lane of a highway, and somebody meanders on from the entrance ramp and slowly just eases in front of me, and I have to slam on my brakes, and I, I start to get the, work the anger up, and, and I'm really interested in doing that, and then all of a sudden I notice, hey, I was going like 80 miles an hour when this happened. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I couldn't keep being angry at them. Why? Because I had to be angry, I had to see them as 100% responsible for screwing up and doing something they shouldn't have done. But now I saw that I participated because I was going 80 miles an hour, and they probably didn't recognize that. And I recall times in my life when I've been in that exact situation, I wasn't doing something bad or wrong. I wasn't being an inconsiderate driver. Uh, I just got on an entrance ramp. I saw, quickly glanced, saw a car in the distance. I didn't realize how fast it was going, but it was going pretty fast. And so I made that same mistake. You know, and, uh, I can't really blame this person now. I can't really see them as being an inconsiderate, you know, bad driver that, uh, that did some horrible, committed some horrible sin that they shouldn't have done. And I couldn't get angry anymore <laughs> that particular day. That's the way this works. When you discover something is amiss with one of these uh, automatic assumptions that happens for us that's driving your anger, uh, you, you have the power to turn it on and off if you can see that something isn't true. So, for example, I said, if, 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 whenever we get angry, probably 50% of the time it's because of, we're seeing things and looking at the world in ways that aren't consistent with reality. If you're a person that gets angry a lot, more so than other people, it's 75% of the time that you're looking at things cockeyed. But you don't know that. Most people don't have the ability to know that. They don't get that system error warning. And they don't know what it is that's driving their anger in the first place. But if you teach them this, if you show them this, they then can get an idea of what's going on and they then can step in on their own with the help of others and, and assess the situation and see if their automatic reactions were correct. Let me give you one final example. Uh, and then, like I say, um, you can pick up this, pick up this handout uh, on the way out so you can remember what we're talking about here. But I call this the French fry story. And, and it has to do with uh, me and my daughter. She was, she's now almost 30. But when she was uh, three or four years old, uh, we were driving home one night from some event somewhere. We were about 30 minutes from her house. And she's in the back seat in her car seat, you know, strapped in the middle of the back seat so I can see her in my rear view mirror. And she starts screaming and whining and complaining, Daddy, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I need some food. You know, and I go, Tracy, we're almost, you know, we're only 20, 30 minutes home, can you wait? <coughs> and she says, no, I can't wait. I'm starving, I need food. All right. So, you know, I pulled into a fast food restaurant. What do you want? She said, I want french fries and an orange soda. I said, okay. So I ordered french fries and an orange soda, and the bag was handed to me. I handed it back to her. She quiets down. I start driving home. Okay, everything's copacetic. Um, so I'm driving a couple minutes, and I decide to look in the rearview mirror, you know, expecting to see her happily eating her food. And so I look in the rearview mirror and don't see her eating her food. What I see her doing is taking the French fries out of the bag and breaking them in half and putting them on the armrest of her car seat. 
And I want you to know, when I had that visual, <laughs> appeared for me. I just welled up with anger. I just, she played me. <laughs> she manipulated me. She lied to me. She told me she was so damn hungry that she couldn't wait. And she's very patiently now, you know, waiting to eat her food. And I was just getting ready to blast her, as, you know, and, and criticize her. But I had the good fortune of having gone through this a zillion times before to realize that frequently I'm wrong when I get that urge, when I get that emotion. And, and I stopped myself, fortunately, and I said, I'm going to ask what she's doing. I don't think she's got a good explanation, but I'm going to ask anyway, okay? So before I blasted her, I said, Tracy, what are you doing? And I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and she says, Daddy, they're too hot for me. I went, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> I didn't go with my urge <laughs> and blast her because she really wasn't doing something bad or wrong. You know, she really hadn't played me. You know, she hadn't taken advantage of me. Both of those things had gotten triggered in my body instantly when I saw that visual. And they were both wrong. You know, they both were not consistent with reality. I didn't know that at the time, but that's where my anger came from. But at least I knew, I had confidence that number three was correct. That had to be the truth, right? I didn't have, I didn't have anything to do with her breaking her French fries and putting them on her armrest. I mean, that was totally her, right? That was on her. That wasn't me. So that's what I thought. And then I'm driving down the road a little bit more, and I went like, oh my God, I, I remembered something I'd forgotten. About two weeks earlier, my wife, daughter, and I had been in a restaurant, and my daughter had ordered a kid's plate, and it had French fries on it. Waitress brings it out, and I see steam you know, coming off the french fries. So as a good father that I try to be, I quickly got up out of my chair and I cautioned my daughter about eating the french fries and I went over and I started breaking the french fries <laughs> in half so they would pull off for her. And I'd forgotten about that. Okay? So what was the truth about number three? Did I have nothing to do with that? No, I taught her the damn technique two weeks earlier. And that's why she was doing it. <laughs> so when I tell you that these things are frequently wrong, one or, all you need is one of them, one of the three big ones, to find that it's wrong. And your anger, just like I said with the, uh, with the um, speeding uh, person cutting me, off, uh, cutting me off thing, all you need is one of them to break up this, this, re, this false reality that gets triggered in her body that drives her anger. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. So um, this, is, this has been this kind of tool. <coughs> Having this kind of information in my stress elimination system, and, and you can do this, by the way, for any emotion. And I have done this for a number of the main emotions that we experience. It's very, very handy. I, I relied upon this very much dealing with the, the natural anxiety that was there for me about having open heart surgery and you know and all the kinds of things that could go wrong and was I making the right decision and blah 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 blah. Um, so it is very helpful when you know the programs that are involved and you have those tools that, that you can access uh, that to be able to step in and make those emotions when you don't want them disappear. So I just wanted to give you a, a couple things. I wanted to give you the message loud and clear. You can learn to eliminate stress. It's not impossible. Stress is not an inevitable, unavoidable part of modern life. You can live relatively stress-free in this crazy world we live in today. Uh, you just have to have the right system, the right understandings for <coughs> doing it. And like I said, I am, I am very, very happy that I went through the surgery and I've been given a, a new lease on life and I hopefully have another 20 or 30 years that I can do talks like this and, and, and share these principles with people. And uh, this is actually my first time uh, speaking since the operation, so I thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. And I hope you've gotten some, at least some insights or some of these questions to go home and think about it. Please practice with this tool. I think you'll find that it, it's reliable. You can go to the bank uh, on it. Anytime you're angry, this is going to tell you exactly why. Uh, whether you can get to the bottom of what's true and what's not true, it's going to depend on each how deeply you want to go and how good you are at recognizing the truth and, and, and when you may be being misled. Uh, but it's very, very powerful once you get uh, your hands on it, once you practice with it a little bit. So again, very happy to be alive, <laughs> very happy to be here, and thank you all very much.